Hello, I'm Andy Briggs and welcome to The Amazing Astronomical Alphabet, a weekly programme in which my Astro Radio co-presenter Daz and I will be talking about anything astronomy related which begins with the week's letter of the alphabet. We'll each choose some things to talk about which are in some way related to the universe, but neither of us will know what the other has chosen. We will then reveal facts about them which are weird, strange, bizarre or simply interesting. Well, welcome back, dear listeners, to the amazing Astronomical Alphabet uh, with me, Andy, and uh, my esteemed co-presenter here, Daz. How are you, Daz? I'm fine, thank you very much, Andy. It's uh, a bit mixed weather here, but last night I was get out and uh, actually see some Perseids. Oh, you but lucky the pesky, Yeah, the pesky little blighters every time one appeared. Uh, it would be the opposite direction from where the camera was facing. <laughs> no matter which way I put it, they, they know you know. know. <laughs> but it's, um, but uh, yeah, but uh, nice, nice views of the uh, Jupiter as well. So yeah, yeah, been been out playing uh, yourself. Well, we've um, we've got a, a yellow warning for high temperatures, uh, okay. which means it's about thirty four degrees here. At the moment, oh, I mean, tepid, it, tepid, tepid. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's a bit cooler than yesterday. It was 36 yesterday, but it's dropped a little bit. Uh, we're going to go and plunge into the sea tomorrow morning because that's obviously yeah, the best place like to be. Plan. And uh, we've had a week of clear skies in the mornings. And then in the afternoon, about three or four o'clock, this level of uh, high altitude haze drifts in and stays like it for the night. So I've had mm. completely clouded out skies, a doctors for about the last three or four days. Yeah, uh, because it knew the Perseids were hitting their peak. Obviously. Oh, it's, yeah, it, it's it's the law, isn't it? Okay. There's, um, if you get a good meteor shower, then we're going to uh, uh, bring all the clouds in. Um, yeah. I mean, I've I've had to sit here and uh, see the likes of Mary and Roger and uh simon all posting their images of yeah you know, know. 10 15 uh meteors per se a night uh i know because they've had clear skies and uh but yes yeah, so I, I managed to see some um i haven't gone through the uh the memory card for the phone yet but uh, i don't hold out much hope as i said they were coming from every direction but uh where i was pointing the camera um oh, what a shame but, uh, saw some well, nice satellites Oh, yes, of course. There, there's always that. <laughs> and we, we hope, dear listeners, that you managed to see some Perseid meteors last yeah. night because it was the peak last night of the, the Perseid meteor shower. I've drawn a blank this year. The, the other thing that you have to be careful of with the Perseids, of course, is the moon. And the moon mm. wasn't really a problem this year. I haven't no. looked at next year yet to see if there's a moon. Uh, but, um, you know, some years you get to see them, some years you don't. You just have to take it on the chin. Yeah. Anyway, we're back with the amazing astronomical alphabet. We have reached the dizzy heights of the letter J. And Daz and I are going to tell you about some astronomical things, uh, beginning with the letter J. Uh, and whose turn is it this week, Daz? Uh, me to start this week. Me to start this week. Yeah, and because um, it was so hard, I'm quite glad of that. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so uh, yeah, so... Over to you then for the first J. And let's yep, see what right. you've managed to come up with for the first J. Right. Now, this one will surprise you. Well, go on. It, that J, is, yeah. J is for the Jupiter crisis. <gasps> da, now, da, da. Yeah. Did you know there was a crisis on Jupiter? I did, actually. Yes. Oh, OK. Then. The oh, Jupiter well, energy crisis. Now. I'm not going to tell you now. Then. Oh, right then. Well, um, <laughs> we'll see you next week, listen. Well, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> it's bye for now. Um, bye. <laughs> it was um, basically for the last five, uh, 50 years, which I didn't know. Nobody bothered to tell me. I didn't re re receive the memo. You should have been told. Um, that Jupiter has had a crisis. Yes. And NASA scientists are investigating an energy crisis on Jupiter and believe they have solved the mystery of the planet's unacceptable, uh, unexpectedly high temperatures. Well, you know, where's, where's, well, I don't know. Uh, Jupiter is five, five times as far from the sun as Earth is, and as such should have uh, an average temperature in its upper atmosphere of approximately negative 73 degrees Celsius. Instead, the planet's temperature is an astonishing 426 degrees Celsius. 
a figure that has left scientists puzzled for a past century. Well, why didn't they ask me? Well, why didn't you could have told them that. Ah, of course, I could have. Yeah. And they actually have found that they what they believe they have found is that it's Jupiter's intense aura. The most powerful in the solar system is responsible for heating the entire planet's upper atmosphere to surprisingly high temperatures. So we've, we've um, got uh, we've got images, haven't we, of uh, Jupiter's aurora? Yeah, yeah, uh, they, they, they are very, very. Uh, I think it was uh, one of the very, Voyagers, wasn't it? Who took the first one, if I remember right? Yeah, took the caught, caught the first um, yes, aurora. Um, that's right. But it is very, very intense and. Um, you, uh, as you know, when they son, uh, sonification of uh, space and all that, they've actually listened, and you can hear the auras and uh, things like that kicking off. Um, yes. And as it says here, that uh, Jupiter has the biggest aurora and most intense, because um, it's the biggest planet, so it's a lot. Well, yes, that makes sense. Yeah, makes so, yeah. sense. Um, the aurora on Jupiter are visible bursts of light that occur when charged particles interact with the gas giant's atmosphere. This is the same phenomena, phenomena da, 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 da. that creates the aurora borealis, better known as the northern lights on Earth. Mm. It was recently discovered that it was also the cause of huge bursts of X-ray that erupt from the planet every 40 minutes, producing hundreds of gigawatts of energy, an amount that would take one power station on Earth years to produce. So it's wow. kind of whacking out some power. Whacking out some power, uh, yes. Scientists are now more confident that the volcanic moon Io has led to huge amounts of heat in the upper atmosphere. This is a theory that has been proposed previously, but without adequate observations, it was unable to be confirmed. High resolution temperature maps from the Keck 2 telescope in Hawaii, uh, combined with the magnetic field data from Hisaki and Juno, meant scientists could see the aurora sending a pulse of heat towards the equator. It was previously thought, uh, based on planetary models, that winds caused by heat from the aurora and directed towards the equator were redirected westward due to the uh, 43,000 um, kilometer per hour speed at which Jupiter spins, nice. giving the planet a day less than 10 hours long and preventing auroral energy from escaping at the polar regions. New observations contradict this, finding that the winds are weaker than expected. What's more, our highly, uh, what's more highly detailed maps now suggest that heat in the upper atmosphere is widely distributed with only a slight decrease at the equator. Uh, Tom Stallard, uh, Stallard sorry, uh, Associate Professor at the Planetary Astronomy at the University of Leicester, who co-authored a paper on the findings, said, We also revealed a strange localised region of heating well away from the aurora, a long bar of heat, heating unlike anything we've seen before. Though we can't be sure that what this feature is, I am convinced it's a rolling wave of heat flowing equatorward, uh, from the aurora, so wow. there's a rolling, rolling wave. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Observations from Hisaki uh, made another striking, dis made other striking, uh, striking discoveries, including that Jupiter's magnetic field is strongly influenced by solar winds, streams of high energy particles from the sun, and the, that the separate magnetic fields from the winds are compressed when they meet Jupiter's. The result is an enhanced aurora greater than it would be if the Hawaiian Observatory recorded the planet at a different time. So if they're looking at the right time, they can see this happening. If they're not, then they'll miss it. Uh, O'Donoghue said, Juno's magnetic field data provided us with a, a ground truth as to where the aurora was. This information isn't readily available from heat maps. It, as heat leaks away in many directions. Picture this like a beach. If the hot atmosphere is water, the magnetic field mapped by Juno is shoreline uh, and the uh, aurora is ocean. We found that water from the ocean, uh, we found that water left the ocean and flooded the land and Juno revealed where the shoreline was to help us understand the degree of flooding. Right, gotcha. Donahue 
O'Donoghue added that it was pure luck that astronomers managed to capture this event if we'd observed Jupiter on a different night when the solar wind pressure had not recently been high, we would have missed it. It also It is also thought that Saturn, Uranus and Neptune also have energy crisis in which uh, their upper atmospheres are unexpectedly hot. And while there is evidence that Saturn's aurora is behind this mystery too, Uranus and Neptune are so far that a probe is likely needed to verify such claims O'Donoghue also tweeted. So, so you're going to be able to sleep at night now. The, the, crisis the energy so crisis right. on Jupiter has been solved. Interesting yeah. that they should mention Uranus, though, because Uranus is actually warmer than it should be given its position in the, in the solar system. Well, it's either the fact that Uranus is warmer than it should be or Neptune is colder than it should be, but it's thought yeah. that Uranus is warmer than it should be. The mechanism that's been put forward for that up until now is that uh, all the gas giants, since they were formed, have been shrinking and um, radiating away heat in, in the process. But when whatever it was, not Uranus on its side, that stopped that process. And Indeed. hence Uranus is, is, is warmer than it should be. So this is, if this is actually the reason because, because of the, you know, uh, the same sort of processes, then that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, considering they think that Io is involved in it as well. Um, there were, yes, I, I actually read that article and it only mentions Io once. It, it didn't, that's really, right. didn't really explain what Io had to do with it. Because so, um, uh, I did read another article, and I don't know where it is. I don't think I've got it here at the moment. Um, and it said something about, you know, where we, we were talking about interactions between planets and their satellites, where you get yeah. um, a transfer of material. Yes. Um, and it, that was sort of like explain that for Io is doing the same, and it's dropping all this stuff into the atmosphere, which is helping to create the processes that's causing these very huge um, auroras, energetic auroras. Um, that's right. That's right. So, oh, but uh, that, there's your homework for the week there. See if you can find out anything more where IO comes into that uh, energy crisis. Because Okay, it, well, we'll have a look. We'll see if we can see find, we can find out, out anything more. And yeah. we'll, 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 uh, we'll, we'll chat about it next week because I, I hate it when they just do that in articles. They just mention something yeah. by the way, uh, but don't explain what they're talking about. So that being true. Yeah, I wondered if it was a misprint, actually, that the, it should have been something else, because it doesn't mention IO anywhere else in that explanation, still uh, less provided a mechanism. Say, scientists are now more confident that the volcanic moon IO has led to huge amounts of heat in the upper atmosphere. This is a theory that had been proposed previously, but without adequate observations, it was unable to confirm. Yeah, that's all it says. Yeah, but that doesn't really explain anything. No, because I'm not, um, what they say in that it's actually radiating enough heat that it's actually affecting the, the, the top layers of the atmosphere. or Which I find difficult to believe. To yeah. Find, it's given um, the size of Io and the vastness of Jupiter. Yeah. But it seems that the, the actual main heating is coming from these aurora, yeah, yeah. In these heat waves. Uh, so, so, so basically, the, the solar wind is causing these powerful auroras and, yeah. and, and wave, waves of heat from the aurora traveling over the planet, raising yeah. its average temperature. Because it appears that, that, that Jupiter's magnetic field itself is squeezing the um, solar winds, the magnetic fields from the solar, from the solar winds to actually create these uh, powerful aurora. So yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I could have told them that they shouldn't have worried. They wouldn't have lost sleep for 50 years if they'd let me know. Well, that's it. Excuse me one moment. Uh, yes. You're okay. Yeah, fine. I'm just, uh, I'm just shutting the window because next door I've got heavy earth movers on their land. So it's a bit noisy. So apologies, listeners, if you can hear the sound of heavy machinery in the background, but uh, there we are. I've just had to shut the window. Anyway, so that's that's that yeah. mystery pretty much well they think it's pretty much solved oh, then so that's solved, that's yeah. quite interesting i still like to know exactly how io comes into the equation so perhaps you could find that yeah, out yeah. if, if you can find that ever um, see if you can find anything j is for janus that's yeah. uh, that's j a n u s which is predictably a moon of saturn 
and it is named after Janus, who was a Roman god. The Greeks didn't have a Janus or, or even an equivalent in their mythology, but the Romans had Janus, who was a two-headed god. Do you happen to know what Janus is the god of, Daz? Um, I've, there's something niggling me in the back of my head and something to do with wine. Absolutely not. So um, he's, he's actually the god oh, of lots of things. Here's a list of the things that Janus was the Roman god of. Beginnings, gates, yeah. transitions, time, duality, doorways, passages, frames, and endings. Okay. So, uh, you know, you could have a, a Roman, the Romans could have had a doorway that was presided over by the god Janus. So interesting, eh? It's, well, yeah, it's because a... yeah, sorry, um, it's um, because I know um, when I used to dabble in uh, archaeology and all that, mm. they used to have little shrines at doorways which were uh, which were dedicated to Janus. Yes, that's you can right. Understand and, why? Yeah, okay, and that's why. Know. Yeah, I think with the wine, you're probably thinking about Bacchus rather than Janus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it was wishful thinking. <laughs> uh, well anyway so that's quite interesting so so janus was a roman god of all those mm. things including doorways janus the moon was identified by an astronomer called adwar dolphus on the 5th of december any idea of what year have a guess at the year uh pick what a, we talk about a figure uh, out of the year um 19 no 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 i'm not gonna go 19 1878 no, it should have stuck with 19. It was actually quite late. Janus was no. discovered on the 15th of December, 1966. What, and what December, sorry? 1966. 90. No, 19th of December, did you say? I, I said the 15th of December. 15th, oh, 15th of December, December right. 1966. Right. So not that long ago. But he wasn't the first to actually see it because another astronomer called uh, Jean uh, Techereau, and you have to excuse my pronunciation <laughs> if it's wrong, he had actually photographed it on the 29th of October that year without realizing it. And then another astronomer found an object in the same orbit on December the 18th. So just, you know, three months or so, just under three months after uh, Jean uh, sorry, uh, Dolphus had, had actually identified it. So Richard Walker observed an object in the same orbit a couple of months later, but he couldn't reconcile it with the previous observations. It seemed to be in a slightly different orbit. So there was a bit of a mystery going on there. And it took 12 years until October 1978 for two other astronomers called Stephen M. Larson and John W. Fountain they realized that the 1966 observations were best explained by two objects. Oh, okay. And these two objects were, have since been named Janus and Epimetheus. And they share very similar orbits, which is where the confusion arose. So Walker is now credited with the discovery of Epimetheus. Voyager 1 confirmed the, uh, the fact that these two moons were in very, very, very close orbits in 1980. And it's very strange because this is leading to some very unusual behavior of these two moons. And in fact, behavior unique so far in the solar system. So what actually happens? The distance between the two orbits is only 50 kilometers which is actually less than the radius of each moon. Both moons are, are heavily cratered. Um, uh, and, you know, they're a few hundred kilometers in size. J Janus is 203 kilometers by 185 by 152. And it has a very low density. So it's probably going to be ice, largely. Uh, and the fact that it's got a high albedo would lend credence to the fact that it's largely made of ice. So these two orbit only 50 kilometers uh, with a difference of only 50 kilometers and they orbit very closely. And what happens as they go around Saturn, one of them catches up with the other because it's in a slightly lower orbit, if you like. And when this happens, 
the mutual gravities, they approach each other and they never get closer than 10,000 kilometers. But as they approach each other, even at that distance, their gravity is enough to lend momentum to the inner moon, which is Janus, and lose momentum for the outer moon, which is Epimetheus. Now, I wonder if you can imagine what effect that has with, with, with um, Janus uh, losing, uh, gaining momentum and Epimetheus losing momentum thanks to their gravitational attraction. What do they well, do? Then, yeah, well, you, you end up with different um, orbital. Uh, well, you, you wouldn't be able to track them on the same... Uh, to, to the timing would be uh, all to all to ride. But this this results in the moons doing something specific. Do they swap place? They do. Well done. They actually mm. swap places. The inner moon becomes the outer moon, and the outer moon becomes the inner moon. Well, yeah, actually thinking about it, yeah, if that would make sense, it yes. would because yeah. they're so because they're fifty kilometers apart in, in orbit. And because one gains momentum, the other loses it thanks to their mutual gravity. And, uh, and this is what happens. It's the only two moons in the solar system that do this, that they actually yeah. swap places. And uh, this exchange, this uh, swapping of orbits, takes place every four years. And uh, the next one is due in uh, oh, next year, in fact, in tw uh, 2022. Uh, oh, these two moons will actually swap places. So it's a really weird orbital configuration. So it really is. That's, yeah, that's amazing. That isn't it, it, it is, isn't it? Yeah, the moons. Yeah, I'm just places. looking at images of them, and as you said, they are uh, heavily cratered. And uh, considering yeah. their size, uh, both of them have at least one very large crater. In fact, Janus looks as though it's got a, a crater that's almost punched a hole into yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. It's got a very large um, crater. And uh, it, its surface, incidentally, is thought to be older than uh, the surface of Prometheus, but younger than Pandora, in case you want an indication of, oh, of where, okay. where it fits in time scales. So, so there you are. So, um, at each encounter, Janus's orbital radius changes by 20 kilometers, and Epimetheus is by 80 kilometers. And Janus is, is uh, less affected because it's four times the mass of mm. Epimetheus. So yeah, this is why it, do, it doesn't move as much. But that is, I find that absolutely incredible that you can have moons yeah. that, that swap orbits. That's unique, yeah. as I said, uh, so far as we know, it's unique in the solar system. Yeah. So I that's... Mean, my, my answer was more of a sort of like an educated guess because I thought, well, if one's speeding up, it's going to move outwards and if one's slowing down it'll move inwards, inwards so that's why i thought yeah. well yeah they'll, uh, they'll swap places oh, that's well, excellent. i didn't know that. well that's reasoned good. well reasoned Dad. yeah well reasoned yeah. there we are so yeah. there we are so yeah. that's uh, that's the um that's the moon janus and the roman god janus god of beginnings gates and all the rest of it j is for louise freeland jenkins um she lived uh-huh uh, -huh. uh from 19, uh, sorry, 1888 to 1970. Um, and she was an American astronomer who compiled a valuable catalog of stars within 10 parsecs of the sun, uh, as well as editing, edit, editing the third edition of the Yale Bright Star catalog. Wow. Um, uh, she was born in Fitchburg, uh, Massachusetts, in 1911. Uh, in 1911, she graduated from Mont Holyoke uh, College. Uh, then she received a master's degree in astronomy in 1917. Right. Uh, from the same institution. From 1913 to 1915, she worked at the Algini Al 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 uh, Observatory in Pittsburgh. I probably got that wrong. Mm. Afterwards, she was an instructor at the Mount Holyoke uh, from 1915 to 1920. About 1921, she moved to Japan before becoming a teacher at the Women's Christian College, a missionary school. Uh, she returned to the United States in 1925 after her father died. Uh, a year later, she returned to teach at the school in Hemiji, um, 
I can't pronounce those words, so we won't try. Uh, in 1932, she returned to the USA and became a staff member at the Yale University Observatory. She was co-editor of uh, the Astronomical Journal starting in 1942 and continued in this post until 1958. She would return to visit Japan later in her life. Um, she was noted for her research into the trigonometric, trigonometric parallax of nearby stars. She also studied variable stars. Um, and she's actually got wow. a crater on the moon named after her. Um, and guess what it's called? Jenkins. <laughs> no, never. Never. Yeah. So, but that's all I've got on this uh, amazing lady. She uh, she was an amazing um, lady, wasn't she? So, uh, yes, yeah, she, like I said, she's more renowned for compiling this valuable catalogue of stars within 10 parsecs of the sun. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I came across her and I thought, well, this is a lady I haven't heard of before. So, uh, fair play to her. Um, and again, somebody living in a time when it couldn't have been easy to make for a female no. to make a mark in astronomy. Yes, because I mean, she's actually smack bang in the middle, isn't she? All the way yeah. through, because 1888 to 1970, um, that was the prime time for uh, uh, the uh, uh, subjugation of uh, women as obstacles. Absolutely, in, absolutely. In astronomy. But yes, she's uh, so somebody that we've never heard of before, or I ha I hadn't anyway. So uh, no, I'm so Louise Freeland Jenkins. If anybody can find out any more information about her, uh, please let us know. Because, um, like I said, she on Wikipedia she warrants less than a page, really. Which wow. is sad. It is sad, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, very sad. So, yeah, it's, miss, it's, miss, it's, miss people Jenkins. come and go through history and and achieve great things, and then. Then I've forgotten, which is yeah. Well, it's, it's, and this is what I always think about the Harvard computers, um, the work that they did and the breakthroughs they made. Um, but they were all sort of like uh, the 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 honors went to the gentlemen that they were working course, for rather than themselves. So yeah. yes, it's a uh, it's a shame. Ah, so that go. was a quick one, so Andy. So back to right. you. Well, moving on. J is for jets, specifically. Relativistic jets. Oh, okay. Yeah, not the uh, not the aircraft. Now these are jets of plasma that are basically uh, shot out of astronomical objects. You normally hear about them in association with with supermassive black holes, but pulsars can also create them as as well. So you can have these jets for pulses. What are they? They are jets of plasma, highly charged, extremely hot plasma that are emitted from the magnetic poles of things like supermassive black holes and also pulsars. Some of these jets are extremely long. If you look at M87, where we know there is a supermassive black hole because we now have an image of it. M87 was first noticed as being something odd because of it, it had this streak of light shooting out of it. And I think that was over 100 years ago. But of course, in those days, nobody could identify what on earth the streak of light shooting out of a galaxy was. And it wasn't until instrumentation improved that we could see that it was a jet. It extends for 5,000 light years. So if you can imagine the energy required to shoot a jet of plasma through 5,000 light years, which of course is 5,000 multiplied by 6 trillion miles, then you get an idea of the power behind these things. The jet in M87 is pointing more or less directly at us, so it's highly visible. There is an equivalent jet pointing away from us, but it's drowned in the light of the galaxy. It's, it's not really visible. Interestingly, jets always come in pairs. You never see just one jet. There is always two jets shooting out of the uh, magnetic poles of the supermassive black hole um, and, the, and the pulsar. Now, there's another galaxy, which you may be familiar with, Daz. It's called Hercules A. 
Mm -hmm. And that has an amazing appearance, but it doesn't look anything really special in optical wavelengths. But if you look at it at radio wavelengths, it's got two enormous jets only visible at radio wavelengths, shooting out and accumulating in vast lobes of plasma. And they are vast. And the span of those two jets, of those two lobes, if you took the distance between the ends of the, the lobes, if you like, is 5 million light years. So these are enormous structures. The galaxy is dwarfed by these lobes of plasma. So what happens is these jets shoot out for thousands of light years and the material piles up, if you like, the plasma piles up in these, these vast lobes. And we're not quite sure why it does that. It's to do with magnetic fields in the, in the intergalactic medium, almost certainly. But it's a, it's a stunning image. If you get a chance, look up Hercules A and, and find the radio image of it. And it's, it's just absolutely stunning. Now, how do these jets get created? Well, astronomers think that what happens is this. A supermassive black hole, or no, sorry, I should say a lot of supermassive black holes have disks of material around them that are spiraling into the black hole like water down a plug hole. And this leads to the black hole consuming enormous amounts of material. In the case of the black hole in the middle of M87, 90 Earth masses per day it's consuming which uh, is, is, you know, mind blowing. But the black hole has not got an infinite capacity to digest material that's falling into it. And some of the material cannot be eaten by the black hole and gets channeled by the black hole's magnetic field towards the poles where in a process or the magnetic pole, should I say, where in a process that we don't really understand yet, the jets get focused and shot out along the magnetic field of the black hole thousands of light years out into, into space. Obviously, the, the magnetic field does not extend that far, but it acts probably as some sort of accelerator to accelerate these particles so that they, they fly at what's called relativistic speeds, in other words, very close to the speed of light. And there you have your jet which extends for thousands of light years. But there's something else about the jets that is quite important. And that is, as the jets punch through the, the gas of a galaxy, they disperse it. And what this means is that some of the gas, that, some of the gas clouds that could have collapsed to form stars are dispersed so the stars don't get created. So these jets from black holes act, if you like, as a throttle on the amount of star production in the galaxy, telling us yet again that the evolution of galaxies and supermassive black holes are deeply intertwined and that the jets play an incredible, incredibly important role in deciding basically which stars get created and which, which don't. So it's very important to study these jets and thanks to the image of MA, the black hole in the middle of 87, astronomers are making real progress in it now because they realized just a couple of months ago that the light we see in that iconic image of the black hole at the middle of 87 is polarized. The light coming from the gas and material surrounding it is polarized. And this has enabled them to see where the magnetic field around the black hole is. And that's going to tell us a lot about how it behaves. So exciting times ahead. So there you are, relativistic jets, not just from supermassive black holes, but from pulsars. And the same is true, the same process occurs, that the immense gravity of the pulsar pulls material into it. Some of it gets channeled to the magnetic poles and comes out in the form of these, these focused jets. How they get focused and shot out is, is, an area, is an area of intense study at the moment because we're coming to realize just how important these jets can be in the evolution of a galaxy. Do you know what Jean's mass is? I used to know a Jean and she was pretty massive, but, yeah. uh, but I didn't know really, I didn't know you were equated with her. 
So, no, 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 no. Um, it was a bloke. <laughs> she's a lovely lady. Um, <laughs> she's, uh, it, this is actually Sir James Hopwood Jeans. Oh. So it's not James Dean, it's James Jeans. Jeans. And he was a uh, English physicist, an astronomer, a stroke mathematician. And his, what I refer to as Jeans Mass, is he worked out through uh, mathematics, the amount of material a, a, a gas cloud is need uh, uh, amount of the amount of material that is accumulated in a gas cloud for it to be able to collapse itself and so to go on to form a star. Ah, I see. Well, um, so that's what's that's basically what his uh, equation was worked worked out to. Um, I could go through the mathematics, but I don't please, understand please it. Don't, so there's there, there's no there's no point. Uh, uh, boring. Um, but he was a, a very interesting chap. He was. A, uh, it seems he was actually born in Ormskirk in Lancashire, uh, in England, um, and uh, he uh, he uh, uh, attended uh, public schools, uh, private schools, and that. Um, then he went on to uh, Cambridge, uh, Trinity College, Tech Cambridge, where he was a gifted student. Um, and Jeans counselled to take an aggressive approach to the Cambridge Mathematics Tripos competition. Um, he there is lots and lots of accolades. If you um, go on to uh, a web, the, go on to the website, and are you pack put in um james jeans and you will find out about actual james jeans uh but if you just put in james mass what came up was a another website my wiki wikipedia one so yeah. it's true and it was just loads and loads of accolations uh, accolades and um uh quotes of all the writings and all the things he was done he's very prolific and it stretches for about nine or ten pages Hi. um of all these things which are very very interested so that was gene's mass so that was he calculated how much uh, matter was needed in a gas cloud considering the energy and the heat yeah. for it to be able to collapse yeah, in on itself star. And so to start form a star oh, this is, James um, means, I, I seem to remember and i may be totally wrong in this but it's just what pops into my head I believe that James Jeans was a proponent of the idea that the moon was formed by a passing star dragging, literally dragging material out of the earth in a long stream, which then coalesced to form the moon. I may be uh, totally wrong about that, but uh, that's that's what came into my head. In which case, it was totally wrong. Just having a quick look, see if I can find anything yeah. in here um i'm probably i'm well. probably deceiving myself but but when you said james jeans that's the immediate connection that came to mind in my head anyway yeah. um now i can't find anything about okay. the moon in this right. well, I, I, I will i will uh, have a look and see if i can verify you that. you probably find you are correct like i said because he's he had his finger in so many different pies i know i know um yeah. but uh yes but as i said i thought i just mentioned jeans mass on there oh. but the other one that you you dragged in was actually jets from quasars ah, um right. you've explained basically the same principle of how they work yeah um but in uh this is from march 9th uh 2021 so not that long ago um and uh, scientists uh have found the most distant quasar shooting out powerful radio jets oh yes i remember this story yes absolutely yeah, um a newly discovered quasar from the early universe is the most distance found to date that's shooting out powerful radio jets Astronomers using the European Southern uh, Astronomy uh, Observatory's Very Large Telescope, VLT, you know, amazing these names, recently discovered the quasar called, and this is uh, this rolls off the tongue, P172 plus 18. Uh, oh, yes. It's, uh, it's poetic, poetry. isn't it? It's poetic. Yeah, po which is so far poetry. away, <laughs> which is so far away that it takes about 13 billion years for the light from that quasar to reach her, uh, where uh, we observed the object as it was when it was the universe was just about 780 million years old. So, you know, the universe hadn't you know, been in existence more than five know. minutes. And there, um, yet there we, was already a quasar doing its or, thing. Yes, doing its thing. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, while the new find is not the most distant quasar ever detected, so there's some even older, uh, it appears to be the most distant radio loud quasar or radio jet emitting. But that, that's quasar. the thing, because some of these jets are visible at optical wavelengths, like the one in M80 coming out of M87. Some of them are only visible in radio wavelengths. Uh, yep. And I believe there are a few that you can only really see in X-rays as well. So yeah. each one is going to have a different story behind it, obviously, in the way that it's been produced. Um, but you mentioned quasars just for the benefit of our listeners. Let's just nail down the distinction here. So when you have a young galaxy whose supermassive black hole is swallowing, frankly, incomprehensible amounts of material and making it so bright that it's visible across the universe, which is why we thought initially that quasars were close objects because we couldn't conceive of anything that bright being far away but they are the brightest objects in the universe these are young galaxies with young uh, galactic centers that contain super ravenous black holes and we call this an active galactic nucleus or or agn now they do have supermassive black holes at their centers, but quasars are specifically galaxies that are not very old, they're young galaxies, and they have these incomprehensibly um, ravenous black holes at their center that are, that are heating up the material surrounding them to such a temperature that they glow in all sorts of wavelengths and you can see them from the other side of the universe. So that's that's a quasar, just to, just to clarify. Yeah, that. thanks for that, Andy. But we also have, of course, active galactic nuclei that are not quasars that we find in older galaxies. And basically, it's any galaxy that has got a supermassive black hole at its center that is, is, is consuming material at a, at a copious rate and generating, you know, X-rays, visible light right across the spectrum. Uh, and, and they are active galactic nuclei. So there you are. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just carry on with uh, what was actually uh, uh, quasars are extremely bright celestial objects powered by supermassive black holes yeah. that lie in the center of some galaxies. Sometimes quasars are so bright that they eclipse the very galaxy containing them. Round lady, <laughs> radio loud quasars shoot out powerful jets that are strong sources of radio wavelength emissions. Yeah. Uh, this quasar was first identified as a radio source when scientists using the Magellan Telescope at Las Campanas uh, Observatory in Chile detected the powerful jets. Basically, as soon as they saw the data, they knew they had a yeah, something special absolutely. and a very, very loud. Um, and so uh, the, distant, uh, the distant jet shooting quasar is powered by a supermassive black hole, as I said. That is about 300 million times more the mass of our own sun wow. uh, and it's growing Heavy. quickly pulling in yeah. and swallowing surrounding matter with its gravity yeah um all right the researchers think the connection between the quick growth of the black hole like this and the jets that shoot out of the radio loud quasars like p172 plus 18 according to the statement in particular the astronomers think that these powerful jets might interact with nearby gas as you said um in a way that pushes the gases into the gravitational grip of these black holes uh increasing more flow of gas yeah. into the falling into them yeah um so yes yeah, so i thought i'd just mention that uh because you you mentioned in jets that uh we find them virtually uh in some very interesting places and as you said they stretch so far across oh, the uh, you know space um they are so large you can see them um, millions of light years away literally you know yeah they are um, immense structures yeah and one thing to come out of the observation of the black hole at the center of m87 is that those those um jets um they're not visible in that image a lot of people looking at that image expect to see the jets yeah but the event horizon telescope that took the picture was not sensitive to the wavelengths of light that we see the jets in so that you can see them in that image but they're very dim at about the 10 o'clock and the four o'clock position uh but uh you know this is an exciting area of study at the moment 
And I think the next few years, we're going to learn a hell of a lot more, especially when we have images of other black holes, which uh, we hope to have soon. There we are. That's course, we're expecting uh, the release of um, an image of our own. Um, exactly. the our own local supermassive Sagittarius A star. Yes. Yeah. And the, the Event so Horizon cool. Telescope team are still hoping to release that by Christmas. Yeah, excellent. That'll be I know they're having big problems with it. Um, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We understand why. Yep. Okay. So back to you, Daz. No, it's back to you now because I've done two. Oh, yes. Of course you've done two, haven't yeah. you? So, well, yeah. Yeah. We'll step back in. I am going to tell you all about the fact that J is for JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. JPL, based in Pasadena in Texas, they manage or they create and manage all planetary missions for NASA. So any probe that goes to a planet, whether it was the Voyagers or the Perseverance rover or the Galileo spacecraft or Cassini or any of the wonderful probes that we've seen over the last 50 years has been built and managed at JPL. So I thought I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of JPL because it is a very, very important organization and it itself is managed by, it's overseen by the Californian Institute of Technology or Caltech. They're the ones that sort of look after JPL. But it goes back in history a long time. It goes back, in fact, to 1936, a long, long time ago, when it started life at the Guggenheim uh, Aeronautical Observatory at Caltech. And there were a, uh, was a group of rocket enthusiasts who were doing early experiments with, with rockets. And we should name them Frank Molina, Kian Chuzen, Weld Arnold, Apollo M. Smith, Jack Parsons, and Edward Foreman. And they were building alcohol fueled rockets. And uh, Molina, Frank Molina in particular, he was doing a thesis on them. And he pulled this group of people together to help him with his thesis. And just out of interest, Daz, you'll never guess who his thesis advisor was. Um, Hubble? No, no, not, not too far off, but somebody from that era, obviously, Theodore von Kármán. Oh, okay. He of the Kármán line. The Kármán line, yeah. Yes, um, and uh, for anybody that doesn't know, the Kármán line is that sort of imaginary line where the Earth's atmosphere ends and space begins, if you like. So with the recent joyride flights by Branson and Bezos, there was a, some dispute whether actually exactly, they got into space. Yeah. Did they go beyond the Kármán line? It's an arbitrary line and it differs in different countries. For example, in the United States, the Kármán line where space begins is seen as 80 miles above the ground. Other countries, they see it as 100 miles above the ground. So it's all very arbitrary. Anyway, I digress. So <laughs> um, they got together to, um, to help uh, Molina with his experiments. And they got financial support from you'll never guess the u.s army because they saw it as a potential weapons uh, project of course and they um this group worked on the rockets but they also developed something called a jato which is a jet assisted takeoff rocket so that's a sort of a hybrid of a jet and a and a rocket and they established a corporation to try and market this called the Aerojet Corporation. And that corporation was renamed in November 1943 as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And it was then operated by the army under contract by the university. Hmm. So the group of friends that had set all this up included one Jack Parsons. But unfortunately, in 1944, he was kicked out due to his unorthodox and unsafe working methods, <laughs> believe it or not, because he was the subject of an FBI investigation, and you'll love this, Daz, uh, into his involvement with the occult drugs and sexual promiscuity. <laughs> so, so, drug, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> drug, sex, and rock and roll. He was not considered good material to be at JPL, obviously. You can't trust him with pyrotechnics. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So anyway, you know, the army got very interested. And during the time that JPL was run by the army, they developed two weapon systems, 
the uh, in fact they were the first to um, develop ballistic missiles at, uh, coming out of JPL. Uh, the MGM-5 Corporal and MGM-29 Sergeant intermediate range missiles, if you like. And they also came up with another other weapons prototypes, the low-key anti-aircraft missile system. Um, have you heard of the Aero B sounding rocket? Does that ring a bell? One of the first sounding rockets. rings a bell, but I can yeah, tell you. Yeah. Well, they sort of invented the forerunner of that. And they used to test at White Sands, uh, Edwards Air Force Base, and Goldstone in California. So they were developing these, these early rockets, but they had a stroke of luck because in 1954, JPL teamed up with the engineers working with, believe it or not, Werner von Braun mm -hmm. um, at the Army, Ballistics, um, Army Ballistic Agency's Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, to propose launching a satellite to commemorate International Geophysical Year, which you may remember was 1957-58. And they put forward a proposal to launch a satellite to commemorate that year, which was a celebration of all things technological, basically. Mm. And they lost out because there was another proposal, which was Project Vanguard. I'm sure you've heard of the Vanguard yeah, rocket. Yeah. yeah. Um, they instead decided to concentrate on a, on a, a different project to develop ablative heat shields. Now, this is a type of heat shield that basically, as it's coming through the atmosphere and heats up, wears away in sort of layers, um, which makes it last longer. And uh, they used a Jupiter C rocket to test it. And they did three successful suborbital flights in 1956 and 1957. Anyway, so moving on from that, they then used a Juno rocket and launched the United States first satellite, Explorer 1, on January the 31st, 1958. So eventually they got to, to orbit, which was, uh, which was a hell of an achievement. NASA had just been founded. They took yeah. an interest. Ownership of JPL transferred to NASA in December 1958 and became its primary spacecraft build center, if you like, planetary spacecraft. And JPL, as we know ever since, have had a long and award-winning career, Mariner missions to Venus, Mars, and Mercury. Uh, in 1998, they opened the Near Earth Object Program because uh, they found, it's been found that 95% uh, of asteroids that are a kilometer or more in diameter have been found by JPL's Near Earth Object Program. And JPL was also fantastically among the first to employ female mathematicians you talked about the the human computers yeah um the um in the 40s and 50s jpl employed women to do these calculations because we know that women are exceptionally good at this and in 1961 they hired uh, a lady called diane Uruy as the first female engineer at jpl to work alongside male engineers as part of the Ranger and, and uh, Mariner missions. So there we are. And as we know, JPL go from strength to strength. And when you hear people talking about NASA's probe to Saturn or to, to whatever planet, it's not really NASA's. JPL designed it, built it, and they fly it. Yeah. So they do everything on behalf of NASA. So that's JPL, Daz. Excellent. Yeah, because um, I didn't realize they were pre-NASA. Yes. Um, but of course, um, as we, we were discussing off air, that um, everything before NASA was military. Yes. Um, because all they were looking to do was militarize everything. Build weapons, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and basically just fire things that go bang. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, cause as you said, we've bought uh, Von Braun. Um, he, uh, he of the V2 and uh, uh, V1, V2 uh, German uh, flying bombs. Yes. Um, and of course, and as you said before, beforehand, before they developed their own rockets, uh, that's all they had. They had captured V2s. Absolutely. Um, which absolutely. were they used as um, test platforms. So, yeah, very yes, good. Yes, absolutely. J is for the jewel box cluster. Oh, I feel I must that. admit, it's one of my favorite clusters. It's in the southern sky, so I don't really get to, see, well, I don't get to see it full no. stop. 
Um, I, and I can picture it's, it. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's it's a, a lot of bright stars. There's over a hundred. I do believe there's over a hundred uh, stars involved uh, in the actual cluster itself. But the main bright stars form an asterism, which is an an A, and it's sort of like a right. bit tipped on its side. Right. But all the brightest stars that form the asterism are super super huge stars um they're absolutely massive they're uh, all bright blue except for one which is a big red super giant so you've um, got a mixture of blue super giants and red super giants yeah the there's only cluster. just the one the one red star but wow. the, the the blues are slightly different um because it's an asterism of course things are closer things are further yes, away of course, of course. um so of course you get variation in the blue colors mm. and all that and in fact, three of the stars that actually form the crossbar of the A are called the traffic lights oh, because nice. of the variation <laughs> in their colours. Um, and as I said, it's, uh, it's, it's also known as uh, Kappa Crucis Cluster, NGC 4755, or Caldwell 94, of course, we know Mr. Caldwell. He's actually, his name is, is not just Patrick Moore, it's actually yeah. Patrick Caldwell Moore. Caldwell Moore, yeah. Yes, he, he, he thought it sounded a bit pretentious to use the Cold War uh, part yes. of it, so he always used to just be called uh, Patrick Moore. But then he 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 was delighted with where well, he loved the Messier um, uh, catalog, but he always thought that there were some things that should be added to it. Um, but in the end, what he did is he uh, formed his own catalog. And uh, he's, it, most of them are Messiers, but there are ad additions which also cover the southern sky. I'll, well. I'll let you into a little secret here. I knew the Cold War catalogue, but only a few years ago did I realise it was Patrick Moore. I didn't, you know, it, it didn't occur to me that it was it was Patrick Moore yeah. Uh, yeah. using his middle name as the name for his, his catalogue. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh... But I, I would again recommend, as I always do, that our listeners, they get onto the internet and they have a look for the jewel box star cluster. Yeah, it is beautiful. Cluster. It is beautiful. And it is, it really does stand out. Which, uh, which, um, which constellation is it in, Daz? Um, Just to give our listeners a bit of extra help. It's in the crux. Crux. So it's, it's actually crux. part of the... Um, the crux the, Australis, presumably. Yeah, the, the, the Southern Cross. Yes. Um, is yes. In, in there as well. Um, so uh, the jaw books as a star cluster was first found by Nicolas Louis de la Chelle mm -hmm. um, while doing um, astrometric observations for his 19, uh, 1757 and 1752 star, Southern Star uh, catalogue. Um, he saw this uh, this as a, a, a nebulous cluster in his small 12 millimeter tele inch, uh, which is half an inch telescope. That's a small um, telescope. <laughs> yeah, it can be seen with 12 a, millimeters. A, yeah, uh, it can be seen, um, uh, but he didn't really recognize it as. Uh, 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 he, but uh, was first to recognize it as a group of many stars. The name Jaw Box came from. Here's somebody else you will know. Uh, John Herschel's own description. Oh, really? Of it. Huh. Yes, yes. Uh, one of the famous Herschel's. One of the Herschel's. Uh, yes. This cluster, through um, uh, though neither a, a large or a rich one, is yet an extreme, extremely beautiful and brilliant object uh, when viewed through an instrument of sufficient aperture to show distinctly the very different colours of its constitu uh, constituent stars which give it the effect of a superb, superb piece of fancy jewellery. Right. Um, and I must admit, it's one of the, the objects that I've, I came across um, when I first saw it. I just thought that is absolutely amazing. That is the stars really, are so really bright. Beautiful. And then yes. in the middle, middle, you've got this. And the colours are star. stunning. The colours are stunning. Yeah. They really um, are. And Herschel recorded the positions of over 100 members. So, yes, there is... Uh, uh, but that's actually quite a sizable cluster then isn't it 100 members yeah compared yeah, to um, some if you look at the pleiades for example you know yeah you're talking about probably a dozen or so yeah. main stars so the main asterism can be seen by eye um right. the main stars uh they range around about sort of like between five and six magnitudes so they can be seen um and uh the red one is 
is a B9.5A Cygnus variable supergiant. Fantastic. With an average visual brightness of a magnitude 5.72, but it is thought to be a foreground object. So as I right. said, it's an asterism. So they're not actually in a big cluster. They yeah. are some are in front and some are behind, but you still get the, the asterism of the... Well, as again, something like the Pleiades, they're all very close to each other because yes, exactly. it's effectively a stellar nursery, isn't it, the Pleiades? Yeah. They're, they're very young but if you But if you turned it through 90 degrees, you'd see something else. Oh, of course, of it's course. A, yeah, That's so how just, it works. Yeah. That's how constellations work. Yeah. Amazing. Um, Yes, yeah, so it's regarded one of the finest objects in the southern sky, and I must admit, I would love to be able to see it. <laughs> uh, so maybe one day, maybe. One maybe, day. yeah, I'd, I'd love to go to the southern hemisphere. But you know, I mean, we're only forty-one degrees latitude here, yeah. so I see a lot of the stars that you don't. But uh, I'd still love to see the full southern sky one day. Perhaps I will. Okay, yeah, thank you for that, Daz. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I'm going to um, continue with a place you've, you've done an object j is for jodrell bank so oh so i can see you gnashing your teeth there mate so you have selected jodrell bank as well yes well it's yes. an obvious choice really isn't it yeah and it's a worthy choice as well so exactly. so um i'll just kick off some things that i found out about it i th i'll tell you what I'll tell you an interesting thing this is the way we'll do it i'll tell you some probably unknown facts about it and you can fill us in with the technical stuff about it do you know where the name jodrell bank comes from um oh you probably found that out haven't you <laughs> uh it's written here somewhere <laughs> no I'll, I'll let you go i'll let you go okay the name jodrell bank comes from um a rise in the ground near the site of jodrell bank and uh, we'd better state first of, of Jodrell Bank is a big radio telescope in Cheshire, England. In fact, it's the, the world's third largest steerable radio telescope. And it is called the Lovell Telescope after Sir Bernard Lovell, who basically created it. But we'll come back to that. So there's a rise in the ground near the site known as Jodrell Bank. And this was named after William Jodorell. And uh, his descendants lived uh, in a mansion on the site. He was an archer in the English armies in Wales of Edward the Black Prince da, 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 yeah. in, in the 14th century. And over the decades and centuries, the name evolved from being spelt different worlds from Jodorel with one L, Jodorel with two Ls, Judrel. And then from the late 15th century, it settled down and it's been Jodrell ever since. So that is where the name comes from. Yeah. And do you know what the mansion is called now? It's called Terra Nova School. Ah, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was um yeah, the site was extended in 1952 by the purchase of a farm from George Massey on which the Lovell telescope was built. Right. Yeah. Right. There we are. <clears throat> so Bernard Lovell worked in the war on radar and always had a vision of creating a big radio telescope. And after the war, he um, approached the British government with, with the idea. He became a radio astronomer at the University of Manchester, which has always had very close associations, therefore, with, with Jodrell Bank. And the, the telescope is used mainly for investigating uh, radio waves from the planets and the stars. But it's also done research into meteoroids, quasars, pulsars, masars, gravitational lenses, and lots of other stuff. And also, it was involved in the tracking of space probes at the start of the space age. Now, when the Russians sent uh, their, I think it was Luna 5, rocket to the moon, Jodrell Bank tracked it. And they um they were able to pick up lunar i think it was lunar fives lunar fives radio transmissions back to earth including the first pictures that it took of the moon so jodrell bank received these pictures directly from lunar five and gave them to a british newspaper which really upset the russians because the russians had not yet printed them themselves 
So Jodhra Bank had stolen their glory and uh, the Russians were distinctly not happy about it. Do you have any idea, Daz, which, which British newspaper they gave the pictures to? Uh, wasn't it something like the Times? No, it wasn't. Uh, it's a newspaper that you wouldn't associate with such quality these days. It was the Daily Express, oh. so, <laughs> which in those days was a reputable newspaper, not full of shit as it is now. Yeah. So um, they gave the pictures to the Daily Express and, and basically pipped the Russians at the post and the Russians are upset that yeah, British newspapers was, had got their photos before the, yeah, they'd published them themselves. Yeah, it was Lunar 9, that's right. Lunar 9, I knew it was one yeah. of the Lunars. Yeah, Lunar 9, that's right. So um, so there we are. And these days, Jodrell Bank Observatory, and if you haven't been, if listeners, and you, you live in the UK and you're able to go to Jodrell Bank, do go and visit it because it has a wonderful visitor centre. It's an immense telescope. If you go on the um, main railway line from Manchester to Crewe, the railway line passes just near it. And I was doing some work up in Manchester once and I was on that line and I, it just didn't occur to me that we were going anywhere near Jodrell Bank. And I looked out of the window and looked up and there was the immense dish of the Jodrell Bank radio telescope. I was absolutely thrilled, as you can imagine, totally unexpected. But these days, uh, Jodrell Bank serves two other functions. It acts as the base of um, a radio telescope network in the UK known as Merlin, which is run by the University of Manchester. And Merlin stands for Multi-Element Radio Linked Interferometer Network, which is a, a national UK network that joins radio telescopes together through uh, interferometry to use their combined uh, resolution power. Uh, and Jodrell Bank is the base of that. Also, Jodrell Bank has become the quarters, headquarters, sorry, has become the headquarters of the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array Project, which, as you may know, is a project to build the world's biggest radio telescope across two continents, having a resolution 10,000 times better than any existing radio telescope and half of it is to be built in South Africa and the others will be in Western Australia at the Murchison uh, Radio Quiet site there where they do a lot of radio astronomy in Australia and Georgia Bank was selected of the 11 countries taking part in the SKA project, 11 governments taking part in the project, Georgia Bank was selected to be the headquarters and I think two years ago, they opened a new purpose-built building, which will be the headquarters of the project. The Square Kilometre Array has um, acquired all of the legal permissions it needed from various governments to go ahead. They've achieved that, and they actually physically started work building it next month in two phases. The second phase will be completed somewhere around 2030. So we've got nine years of, of looking forward to the results, although they do hope to start science observations with, a, with phase one, which will be completed in about 2025, but we won't see the full uh, glory, if you like, of the SKA radio telescope until uh, 20, about 2030. So it's a fascinating project, the SKA, and you know, obviously, us British people, we're very proud of the fact that George Rule Bank was chosen as the headquarters for it. And it was a pretty much an obvious choice because their expertise at the telescope and at the University of Manchester in radio astronomy, has, which has, they've been developing since the war, is pretty much unprecedented. So it may have been a bit of an obvious choice to go somewhere um, to set up headquarters where there was all that expertise. So there you are, Daz. That's, uh, do you want to add anything to that that I might have um, Yes, it's uh, also been involved with very long baseline infra infra interferometry. interferometry. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, since 1960, uh, yes, since the 1960s. Mm. Um, and uh, Jodrell Bank has been involved with very long baseline interferometry or VLBI since the late 1960s. Uh, the Level Telescope took part in the first transatlantic interferometer 
experiment in 1968 with other telescopes from Alaquin and Pentic Penticton uh, in Canada. Right. Uh, the Lovell Telescope and the Mark II telescopes are regularly used for VLBI uh, with telescopes across Europe um, and basically across the world. Um, yes, um, and as you said, uh, really, Mr. Lovell, I mean, he basically started his uh, observations at Jodrell Bank using, yeah, using a defunct, uh, or should I say surplus uh, radio equipment. And one of the things he used was a searchlight telescope. And if you see pictures of it, it's a really weird looking contraption. <laughs> um, but he used it to uh, monitor meteors while he actually sat in a deck chair and watched them. And oh, they how, how kind of them. So, uh, he, They, they yeah. also used um, two gun turrets from two British destroyers. That's right. Uh, HMS Revenge and HMS Royal right. Sovereign. Yeah, they, that, yeah, those presumably were the, the, the motors that uh, moved the gun turrets around. Uh, yeah, um, for level to for that, they use those on the level telescope. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And it's it, you know it's a bit of a patchwork of a, a build, really. They they got parts from all over the place, especially for the uh, the driving mechanism that moves the telescope round and round. Okay, it's time to say goodbye. Okay, enough. right. Yeah. Well, obviously, listeners, um, we'll be back next week where we're um, scaling the uh, vertical uprights and forty five degree angles of the letter K. And um, we shall look forward to speaking to you then. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed the programme. And uh, from Daz and myself, we'd like to say goodbye, wouldn't we, Daz? Yes, we certainly would. And next week, it's the kicking cut, not the curly cut, the kicking cut. It's the um, kicking cut. So look forward to that. So everybody stay safe and we'll see you again soon.